The divine name Yahweh means the self-existent one, not the self-existent three. I love the name of God. What greater name could God have chosen to describe his oneness? And if we translate uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 with the actual definition of the name Yahweh, and again, my opponent says, says that oneness is not in the Bible. Well, maybe not the word oneness, but the word one is used hundreds of times in the Bible. And the divine name Yahweh is used over 6,800 times in the Bible, and it means one indivisible God. Hero Israel, the self-existent one, your God is one self-existent one. That's the actual literal rendering of the Hebrew. You can't get any plainer than that. If Trinitarian was right, Trinitarian should believe that there is one God, the self-existent one, as three self-existent ones. It doesn't say three self-existent ones. You'll never find the word persons or names plurally or spirits plurally or lords plurally in scripture there's a reason why god didn't do that because he's one god isaiah 57 15 thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity isaiah 12 6 great is the holy one of israel in the midst of you never the holy three it's almost the holy one so oneness is taught in the bible many many more times than threeness anytime there's threeness just the manifestations of god because he's omnipresent and i believe the word omnipresent is taught in scripture do not i fill the heavens and the earth jeremiah 23 24 god fills the heavens and the earth so obviously he's everywhere present omnipresent psalm 99 1 yahweh reigns he sits between the cherubim never they every time the prophet saw it was always one god and when god said let us make man there's only one god who did they speak to? Who did God speak to? Well, Isaiah, Isaiah 61, uh, Isaiah 6, 1, I should say. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. He was speaking to the heavenly court. Even the NIV commentators say that he was speaking to the heavenly court. The Jews always taught that he was speaking to the heavenly court. And we'll get into that later. Greek scholars prove that Galatians 3.20 states that God is one individual person. A Greek scholar by the name of Bracter says Galatians 3.20 is actually translated from the actual Greek. God is one person. Westward pictures of the Greek New Testament translates Galatians 3.20, God is one individual. And the Amplified Bible brings out the shades of meaning of the Greek. The Amplified Bible says God is one person. You never find a translation that says God is three persons because the Catholic Church developed it. How would you like the United States government saying, we want unity among Christian churches. We're going to sit down and make a council of Nicaea. The Roman Emperor convenes the council, takes all the bishops. I want unity in my empire. You guys are going to agree on something. How would you feel? That's what developed the doctrine of the Trinity. Tertullian, others that, that started Trinitarian ideas that wasn't fully developed until the Athanasius Creed in 4th and the 5th century. And we'll get to that later. So God is one person. The Bible never says that God is three persons. Proverbs 30 verse 6 says, Do not add unto his words, God's words, lest you be found a liar and he reprove you. Beloved, I feel allegiant to God's word. You can call me a heretic if you want because I don't use the word trinity, three persons, because I can't do that because I am a loyal, allegiant follower of Christ. I can't add to the word of God to say something of God that he never said of himself. The Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. If you read Hebrews 1.1, it's talking about God the Father's person. Now, if you, you take the express image of somebody and duplicate him, you see that that's the same person. Now, Jesus is not a second co-equal, co-eternal divine person. Yes, his deity is as God, as the Word, as the Spirit of God, as the, as the deity of Christ, but he's not, never as the Bible say that he is a second divine person, but he's a separate human person when the fullness of time had come. So here we have the express image of his person. The biblical evidence supports the following facts. The Bible calls God only one divine individual person, never three persons, plurally. The apostles and prophets always spoke of Yahweh God as only one divine individual, never three. Whenever the prophets did see an image of God, it was a spiritual image of God, and they saw one divine person on the throne. So the conclusion here is those who say that God is three divine persons are adding to the word of God. Next slide. Whoever desires to be saved, according to the Athanasius Creed, now, I'm not making my proof of the oneness of God. All I'm pointing out is Protestant churches that have blindly followed the Catholic Development of the doctrine of the Trinity, you can find in church history how it was developed. And it didn't happen overnight. It happened over a period of centuries. If you look at the writings of the fathers, they didn't have a developed, fully developed of the doctrine of the Trinity until the fourth century. Uh, here we have whoever desires to be saved must believe in the Catholic faith. And to make a long story short, this is abridged. The Catholic faith is this the Trinity is three divine persons. It says, their persons, their essence. Notice the words, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. 
Can you find the word there just once in the Bible? It's always a he, it's a him. It's never a them and a there. Their persons, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. Uh, and I don't believe the Son is eternal because the Bible says when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman. He was made, literally in the Greek, ek, out of the woman. From the DNA of Mother Mary's egg. From the lineage of David, from the tribe of Judah. So Jesus is fulfilling the Hebrew prophecies, but yet God's Holy Spirit came in and did that incarnation. I don't have a problem with incarnation. It just means the, the supernatural embodiment of a divine being. And we believe that divine being is the one God Almighty, the Father, who manifested himself in flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. So if you look at this, it says the Catholic faith is this. Uh, and uh, one cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. Now, the apostles never used such language. Are the apostles saved? I say to the audience tonight, if Peter and John were sitting in the front row, I wonder what side they'd be on. I wonder what churches they'd be welcomed at. Because they never preached the God as three persons. The Athanasian Creed does. How dare we allow the leaven of Herod, which is church government, impose itself upon Christian teaching. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod, which is church government. And Herod uh, fired the priests, high priest at his will and appointed the ones he wanted. I don't believe that the church should have anything to do with the government as far as uh, doctrine. But that's what the Roman councils did. Next slide. The evidence proves that the Trinitarian Creed uses non-biblical biblical words that contradict the Bible. Okay, the word there I pointed out is never used in the Bible. Nor is there a single verse in the Bible that uses the word persons, plurally. The Bible contradicts the teaching of the Trinity of three divine persons because the Bible calls God only one divine person. Jesus is the express image of God the Father's person. Galatians 3.20. In the Amplified Bible, God is one person. So the definition of the word person. Now look this up. I looked at the Hebrew. I looked at the Greek. I looked at dictionary definition. I find it over and over again. The definition for the word person means a human being, whether man, woman, or child, or an individual human being. So the definition of person means being. Then the definition of being, also a human being or a person. So fact is the words being and person are the same. This mumbo jumbo, the Trinitarian, God is only one spirit. Can you have three persons without three spirits? How could God have three spirits? The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one spirit. One God and Father above all, through all, and in you all. That Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father who is in us if we are true Christians. Praise God. I love God's word. I'm just God's parrot. I'm just repeating what he says, church and, and audience. So the Bible doesn't say this. And the counselors of Job were condemned because they didn't speak right concerning God as my servant Job has. So, there is only one being, one person. God is a God person, one person, and he's indivisibly one. The conclusion of the Trinitarian Catholic Creed is not logical, nor is it biblical. Next slide. The Father and Son relationship is post-incarnational. Why? Because the Bible says so. Not because I said so. Who am I? I don't know nothing. I'm just God's parent. I'm repeating what he says. Isaiah 9, 6. On us a child is born, unto us a son is given. How could the child be born and son be given in eternity past? Except in the mind of God and the plan of God, according to Revelation 13, 8. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They pierced my hands and my feet. Well, that didn't happen in the time of King David. That happened later on in time. When the fullness of time had come, Galatians 4, 4, God sent forth his son made of a woman. The son cannot be an eternal son. But his deity is the deity of the one divine God, the Father, as his word, as his spirit. Uh, Hebrews 1, 5, I will be to him. Jesus, a father. He shall be in the future to me a son. Here we have it. The father-son relationship is not pre-incarnational, but post-incarnational. Psalm 2-7, Yahweh has said unto me, you are my son this day. This day have I begotten you. What day? Luke 1 you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. That was the day that Jesus was begotten. That's when the person, the second person came into existence as a man who was the express image of the invisible God. Now it goes on to say the firstborn of all creation. Well, how could Jesus be the firstborn of all cre creation? In the mind of God. God caused those things to be not as though they were. He was the lamb slain from before the foundation of God, of the world. 1 Peter 1.20 says that Jesus was truly foreknown. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifest these last times for us. How can Jesus, as an eternal son, be foreknown before he was actually known? 
In other words, if the words foreknown means that he had to come into existence later as the son. Thus a child is born unto us, his son is given. That was later in the fullness of time. Ephesians 4.1, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I ask this question. If we are chosen, the God's elect are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And we didn't literally exist, so also Jesus was chosen. My servant, ye are my witnesses, Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses, says Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Who's the speaker? God the Father speaks, and he said, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. So God the Father says, I am he, I'm the servant chosen. Before me there was no God for me, neither was there after me. I, I even am Yahweh, and beside me there's no Savior. God the Father said, beside me there's no Savior. Do we have two Saviors? God plainly says it. And then Jesus said in John 8, he said, Unless you believe that I am he, a direct quote from Isaiah. Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. I and my Father are one as far as deity. Not two different divine persons, but one human person. Now remember, Jesus prayed to the Father. So the audience said, well, Jesus prayed to the Father. You got one God praying to another God. No, Jesus didn't pray as God. God doesn't pray. God don't get tempted. But as a man, Jesus prayed. Because this is what we'd expect if he's fully a man. He couldn't be God praying to God. That's ridiculous. God doesn't pray to God. But as a man, Jesus prayed. But yet he who prayed was also God. Beloved, I can't explain all the details. Uh, God didn't give us the scientific data. But that's what the scriptures teach. When you put all the jigsaw puzzle of God's word together, that's the scriptural data. And I can't explain it all either. I don't think any of us can explain all the details. But this is what the word of the Lord says. Okay, next slide. Psalm 2-7. Yahweh has said unto me, you are my son this day. This day have I begotten you. Luke 131. Jesus was conceived. That's when he was begotten. That's when he came into existence. Peter reflects the thinking of Jewish prophets when he wrote 1 Peter 1-20. He was foreknown. How could he be foreknown before the foundation of the world? Greek scholar Dr. Duncan Heister, who believes in oneness theology, by the way, found him online, explains the import of the Greek word prognosko, which literally means the no, to know beforehand, to foreknow, as it pertains to 1 Peter 1.20. This is what he says. If God foreknew his son, the son was not literally existing next to him at the time of being foreknown. Otherwise, the language of foreknowing becomes meaningless. If words mean anything, Jesus could not have literally existed as an eternal son before he was foreknown. Revelation 4, uh, 8 says that he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now, we are to interpret these scriptures. How are we going to interpret it? The Bible speaks of Jesus being slain or killed before the foundation of the world. It speaks of him being begotten before creation. Romans 4, 17, God calls those things which be not as though they were. We've got to think like God to understand the Bible. All scriptures speak of the Son, and the Hebrew scriptures are speaking of prophetic anticipation of the future glory, of the future child that will be born, the future son that will be given. Hebrews 1, 5, I will be, very plain, I will be to him a father, not in eternity past, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made of the law. This is what the apostles and prophets taught. They were Jewish. They believed in one God, not three persons. The Catholic Church, we got into church history. I'm not proving that. I can take quotes in church history and prove. That's, that was very damning for the Trinitarian doctrine. I, I love church history. I read, read Ignatius. I read Clement. Many historians call them modalistic monarchians because they always make up the majority of believers believed in one God. Monarch meaning one ruler. Modalistic, operating, manifesting himself in different modes as the word. Psalm 35 says, verse 3, uh, says very clearly that by the word of Yahweh were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Jesus is the word. The word was with God. The word became flesh. The word was God. So you can't take another, the word of somebody and make a separate person, a divine person from him. Yes, Jesus in the fullness of time became another person as the man Christ Jesus. Not the God Christ Jesus. But the man Christ Jesus, there's a distinction between the Father and Son. But notice my opponent hardly ever mentions the Holy Spirit. Jesus never prayed, oh, heavenly Holy Spirit. Now, if that's true, if the three persons are co-equal, co-eternal, well, how come, boy, that, that Son, he really messed up because he didn't show proper love and respect to the third divine person. Think about it. And then, and then look at Malachi, look at Genesis. You never find three divine people sitting down talking together. You're misconstruing scriptures. You're adding to the word of God by saying... Elohim, let us make man. Moses was called Elohim, God unto Pharaoh. Dagon was called Elohim, and he's a fish god, one divine entity. And you go on and on. The context of Scripture is what shows whether or not it's a singular or a plural intended. 
And I'll get into that later in my rebuttal if I have the chance. Okay, uh, where am I? I get excited about the Word of God. Hallelujah. Somebody tell me where I am. <laughs> okay, okay, here I am. How are we? I think that's it. How are we to interpret these scriptures? Okay. I will be in the fall. Next slide, next slide. That's good. Yahweh God is one person, one spirit, personal being. He is never called three. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. Never can you find spirits. He is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him, not them, not there, in spirit and truth. Genesis 6, 3, Yahweh said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Because God says, my spirit, that doesn't make another person. If you were saying, my spirit, my heart, you're not saying another person. You're trying to read into the word of God. Oh, my God, one minute. Joel 2, 27, I'll... I am Yahweh your God, none else. It's going to pass. After that, I'll pour out my spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God the Father. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, above all, through all, and in you all. Genesis 1.27 says that we're made after the image of God. If, we are, if God is three persons, then why don't we mirror the image of our maker? We're only one person, so God must be one person. Whenever God speaks of himself anthropomorphically, he speaks of himself as one human person. The arm of Yahweh revealed. Next slide. 53.1, the arm of Yahweh revealed. Exodus 15.6, thy right hand, O God, thy right hand, thy nostrils. It always says, thy right hand, not three sets of right hands. Ezekiel 38.18, my fury will rise to come up in my face. God never speaks of himself having more than one face. Whenever God speaks anthropomorphically, attributing human attributes to God, it's always says one person, just like we're one person. We're made after the image of the invisible God. Praise God. God bless you all.